one, follow along with me as I read. The scripture says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised to pour by his prophets in the holy scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith, faith among all nations for his name. Among whom are ye also the call of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the beautiful day that we have to gather together learn and see the glory of your Son on display through the pages of Scripture. Thank you for the hearts that have a song to sing because we've been redeemed by the precious blood of your Son. Thank you for the Spirit that is present with us that wrote the Scriptures to the holy men that he inspired to pen these words and you preserved them bring them to us today. Pray that you instruct our hearts from these words. Help us to be forever changed because we've been in the presence of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have good news for you today. Today we will finish the introduction to the letter of Romans. <laughs> We've been uh, here for five weeks now, and uh, it's important though, because as we've mentioned before, Paul, unlike he's done in his other letters, he's never been to Rome before to meet with this church, and he is carefully choosing his words. And he is outlining everything in this introduction that he is going to be expounding upon through the rest of the letter. 
or I thought about it this week as he wrote this letter, as we would write a letter to anyone, what, what would we say if we, you know, we were going somewhere and meeting with some folks, but we had never been there before? You know, Paul didn't take the opportunity to say, well, you know, we had a nice lunch last week out by the med with some friends, and uh, I'm doing well, and, you know, things are going okay here. No, he focused on the most important thing that he had to write to them about, and that was the gospel of God. The gospel of God, the good news. It's in verse 1. And he spends the rest of this introduction outlining in seven points what he's going to be talking about through the rest of the book concerning the gospel of God. You'll recall that we broke it down into seven Ps. We've looked at three of those so far. The preacher of the gospel was verse 1. The promise of the gospel was verse 2. The person of the gospel, which is really the focus and the climax of all of this, all of the book, and that's Jesus Christ. That was verses 3 and 4. And today we will look at the last four, the provision, the proclamation, the purpose, and the privilege. Not only is the introduction unique in that normally when you write a letter, and in ancient epistles, it would begin with the person who's writing the letter. And that starts in verse 1, first word, Paul. Everybody see that? So it would be Paul, and then drop down to verse 7, to all that be in Rome. That's how you would begin any letter. So that's how you would start a letter, Paul, to all that be in Rome. Yet everything from verse 1 to verse 7 is all one sentence. All one sentence. You and I would have gotten in trouble in 8th grade English class if we made that all one sentence. Your English teacher would have said, this is a run-on sentence, go back a bit. But he just put one thought all the way through. Seven points. So our first point we're going to find in verse 5 today. And that's the provision of the gospel. You might say, what do we get? What do we get, Paul? If we buy into this thing that you're sending to us called the gospel, what do we get? I want to start by giving you an illustration that I heard this week. A story of a wealthy man and his son. The wealthy man, most of his wealth was tied up in his art collection. And um, he loved his son very much. And his son died unexpectedly as a young man in his 20s. And the man, the father, was so brokenhearted about the death of the son that he died soon after. The day came for his will to be read and for those who were going to inherit his estate to gather. And the father left instructions for how this procedure would go. The first part of the procedure was read, and it said that there was a particular painting that he wanted auctioned off first. Everything was to be auctioned off, all his art collection. And the first picture to be auctioned off that day was a picture of his son. Well, the picture of his son was done by a, a non-renowned artist Nobody really knew the artist. Nobody really knew the son. So when the bidding opened, there was a silence. A long pause. Finally, a servant of the family came forth and said, I don't have much. It's not a good time in my life right now, but I will start the bidding with one dollar. There was another long pause after the bid, and nobody else bid the auctioneer in his gavel and said, sold to the man for one dollar. At that point, the rest of the instructions for how the will was to be read were announced at that time. They came up and read the rest of the will and it said this, whoever cares enough about my son to buy his painting gets everything. Oops, the servant got it all. I think that's a beautiful illustration 
For when we come to Christ and we wrestle with the forgiveness of our sins and we have that hole in our heart that only God can fill, and we come to that place where we understand and we accept the gospel for forgiveness of sin, we find out in the very next breath, we get it all. We get it all. Romans 8 tells us, as we read this morning in our call to worship, we are joint heirs with Christ. He gives it all, and we get it all. 1 Corinthians 1 9 says, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. When I was a kid, there used to be a show on, actually, I think it's still on, called Let's Make a Deal. Everybody seen that? You want what's behind curtain two or curtain three, and there's that, that moment of anticipation where you don't know what's back there. And then at the end of every show, you had what was called the showcase. You remember that? The showcase. Whereas if you got within a certain amount of the, the price of it, not only did you get the, the showcase, you got everything. We'll get it all. The first thing that we get is outlined for us here. In verse 5 it says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship. Grace and apostleship. The by whom there is by Christ, through Christ. Grace and apostleship. The first great thing that we get, grace, conversion, a new life, a new birth, and apostleship, a calling, a vocation. First, let's look at grace. Most of you know by heart Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What is grace? Unmerited faith. I get something from God that I absolutely did not deserve. I got it because our God is a loving, merciful, kind God. I got a new birth. You know, I, I, I remember hearing growing up, but I've never actually seen it, that you know, when, a, when a child is born, the, the doctor has to smack it on the hymen before it takes its first breath. I don't think that that's actually the way they do it. I think they pretty much just clean out the airway and then that first breath occurs. Life. Physical life. For those that are here and you're saved, our birth into the heavenly realm happened in an instant just like that. Born from above. When we repented of our sins and received God's provision for salvation, His Son Jesus Christ, there was a birth that occurred in a moment. Instant. Your heart was transformed and you were placed into the body of Christ. You drew your first eternal breath of eternal life all by grace. We didn't do anything to earn it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. Salvation is not earned by communion or baptism or church membership or doing good deeds. It's not even received by believing facts about Jesus Christ. You can believe that He was the Son of God. You can believe that He was a real person who believed, died on a real cross and rose from a real grave and still not have salvation. The only way you can receive salvation is by God's grace. Repenting of your sins and believing that Jesus is God's provision for your salvation. That's grace. Unmerited faith. So that's the first great thing that we get. We get a new birth. eternal life. Can everybody say amen to that one? Amen. 
second thing that we get follows closely is apostleship. It talks about it here in verse 5, grace and apostleship. Everyone that is born into the kingdom gets a job. It's a vocation. Martin Luther made that clear in the Reformation. People used to have the idea that only the people that work and are employed by the church have a vocation in the, in the, in the ministry. Martin Luther made it clear, though, if you're born again, if you're a believer, you're employed. You have a job. The word apostleship, we've talked about back in verse 1, because Paul was a special apostle, we talked about the word in its general sense means one sent. But there were 12 or 13 special apostles. They had the office of apostle. But we have all been given apostleship in its general sense. He even uses the word we there in verse 5. The Bible actually refers to many people as apostles who were not one of those 12 or 13. One of them is found in Romans 16 where he says, Salute Andronicus and Junia. They were referred to as apostles. In Acts 14, 14, Barnabas is referred to as an apostle. And we could give you many, many more in the New Testament that are referred to as apostles that weren't actually the office of an apostle. Why is that? Because we've all been called. We've all been sent. When we were saved, we got the job. And we're all used. I remember when I was growing up, I, I uh, was involved with a lot of sports. I played baseball, basketball, tennis, golf, uh, on different teams. And uh, I can remember, you know, some of the sports I was better at than others. But in every sport, there was always a, especially if it was through school, not through the county. When, when you went through sports through the school, you had tryouts. Everybody remember that? They had tryouts. And then they would take a certain number out of everybody that came out and they would make the team. There was a, a cut roster that was posted. And if your name wasn't on it, you, you weren't supposed to show up for the next practice because you weren't on the team. Usually in basketball, it was 12 people made the team. But 12 people don't play on the court, do they? How many people play on the court? Five. And on most basketball teams, it's usually about eight, maybe nine that play. There's always three or four that don't get in the game at all. Well, that's not the way it is in ministry. Everybody gets in the game. Everybody participates. Amen? Amen. We all have a job. second we're going to look at is the proclamation of the gospel. This one follows and is tied to the last one. It's found also in verse 5 there. It says, For obedience to the faith among all nations. For obedience to the faith among all nations. Some of your scriptures will say, um, to bring about Obedience to the faith of all nations. Any of you say that? That's actually a better way of saying it, to bring about <coughs> obedience to the faith. Obedience to the faith. What a beautiful way of characterizing Christianity. Obedience to the faith. That, that faith there that's being referenced is not believing faith. It is the uh, structure of faith. It is, it is everything contained in Scripture that we're supposed to follow. It is the walk of the believer's life, the faith. Does that make sense? So we have all been called to the obedience of the faith. Now it's important to understand here, 
when, when, when preachers make comments like that, we have to kind of define it. It is not belief plus works equals salvation. It is obedient faith equals salvation. Do you hear the difference? Because when we were saved, we were all called, we work out our salvation. That's what real faith, real genuine faith does. It's what James was talking about when he says, Show me your faith by your works, or show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. What was he saying? You don't really have faith because you're saying you believe something, but your life is demonstrating something completely different. Because if you've been called by Jesus Christ and you've been saved by Jesus Christ, you're working in the ministry. And you show that by the life that you live. So this phrase sharing the idea of obedient faith with all nations is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, when He says, I want you to go out to all the nations and make other people just like you. Make disciples. That's actually the words that He used. <coughs> make disciples. Make people, make more people that are just like what you are. Just like what you're doing. And then they'll do the same thing. They'll go out and they'll make disciples like you're making disciples. Which also implies that there's something beyond just introducing them to the gospel. Isn't that right? There's a responsibility of taking that person that you've brought to faith in Jesus Christ and then mentoring them into the scriptures. Teaching, sharing, growing together. That's why we have a church, a gathering of believers. What we're doing here is we're growing in Christ. A lot of people think the church exists for bringing in new Christians. That's never the way it's characterized in Scripture. The church is characterized as being one that equips believers for the work of ministry. Ephesians 2. We're in training here. We learn. We're growing. Growing in grace. And then at somewhere around 12.05 today, we sing a song, say a prayer, and then we open the doors, and that's when the ministry begins. Amen? That's when we start doing the job that we've been called to do. And we do that Sunday afternoon through Saturday or Sunday morning. When we gather again. And we need that, don't we? Because that work out there is hard. We get weary. We get tired. We get frustrated. We get discouraged. So we have to come back and recharge our batteries. It's a good fellowship. It's a good teaching. It's a good praying. It's a good singing. Recharge those batteries and go out there and do it again. Amen? Amen. And he commends them, Romans, because he's heard about their walk already. Look down there in uh, verse 8. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, for your faith is spoken of through the whole world. He's heard about their ministry going on there in Rome. The reputation of their church has already received, uh, gotten to Paul. And then later on, near the end of the book, in chapter 16, verse 19, Paul says this, For your obedience has come abroad to all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. So he commends their faith here in chapter 1. He commends their obedience in chapter 16. Two ways of saying the same thing. The third one we're going to look at is the privileges. <laughs> the privileges. That's found in verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, 
called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Three things I want you to see here. Beloved of God, called and saints. Beloved, called, and saints. Now all of these, as I've already mentioned, are going to be unfolded through the rest of the letter. So he's just introducing the ideas here in his outline. Beloved. One of the great privileges of being a child of God. You are beloved. You are beloved. You are the apple of his eye. You are special objects of God's affection. I've used this illustration before, but it goes beyond this little simple illustration. You know, if you're a, if you're, if you're a teacher, you love kids. If you're a babysitter, you, you love kids. And there's, there's, a, there's a love that we have for everybody in the world as Christians. You have a loving, affectionate concern for their souls, for their well-being. But there's a special, a special relationship you have with your own children. Not that you don't love other people's children, but you have a special relationship and a special affection for your own. Amen? Amen. It's the same for God. God loves the whole world. But He has a special love and affection for those that are His own. Christians. Amen? Amen. That's throughout the pages of Scripture. We're loved in a special way. The second one here, call. Now this is not the general call. It is throughout Scripture. The invitation to come and to be saved. Isaiah 40, 40, 45, Be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Isaiah 55, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Ezekiel 33, Turn ye, turn ye. Matthew 11, Come to me all you that labor. John 7, If any man thirst, let him come and drink. Revelation 22, the Spirit and the Bride say come. Beautiful invitations to come and receive the Gospel throughout Scripture. However, this call here is not that. This call here, and he's going to unfold this, unfold this idea throughout the book, is the effectual call. The effectual call. You're going to hear words like chosen, predestined, the elect, let me just give you a, a brief summation of what we're going to be learning there. We all receive the invitation to come to Christ through the preaching of the gospel. But as mature Christians and we come to learn more about our God, we find out that He chose us a long time before we chose Him. Chosen in Christ from the foundation of the world. You're going to hear things like that. He had already chosen you before you chose Him. That's the call. Wonderful doctrine of Scripture. And the last one, saints. We've talked about this one a little bit back in our second message. Saints. The word is hagios. It means holy. The idea means to be separated apart. Separated ones. In the Old Covenant, there was lots of things that were holy. The priesthood was holy. There was a special place within the temple called the Holy of Holies. The different utensils that the priests used were holy. The tithe that you were supposed to give was holy. All kinds of things that had special designations of being apart and separated, devoted, only for God. In the New Covenant, only you You are actually the temple. Ephesians chapter 2. We don't have priests anymore. We don't have a holy of holies in a, in a physical temple anymore. We don't have special things that we use to do ceremonial services anymore. Even the tithe. Uh, let me just leave it hanging there. 
tithe is different in the new covenant. The tithe is based on how the Lord's blessed you. It's not a, a set apart special amount. It's done differently in the new covenant. The idea still exists that we give to the ministry, but it's not a, a, a special set apart amount that has to be. Let me just leave it there. I'm just digging a hole. You are holy in the new covenant. You are the temple in the new covenant. Set apart. Separated. The last one we're going to look at today is the purpose. The purpose. For this one, you're going to have to go back a little bit. But I wanted this one to be last today. I want to finish with this one. It's just one short phrase you find in verse 5. At the end there. <coughs> read the whole thing again. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. That last part there. For his name. For his name. Why were you saved? Why was I saved? Well, to go to heaven, of course. That's a byproduct. Why was I saved? Because I didn't want to go to hell. That's a byproduct. Why were you saved? To hide a multitude of sins. That's a byproduct. That's all secondary. All of that is secondary. Now, the reason why you were saved and the reason I was saved was to bring glory to God. Just to bring glory to God. Philippians 2.10 That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in the earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. 2 Corinthians 4.15 For all things are for your sakes that the Abundant grace might be through the thanksgiving of many redound with the glory of God. We get to go to heaven. We get to not go to hell. We get to hide a multitude of sins. We get to enjoy the benefits of eternal life now. We get lots of benefits, side benefits. But the ultimate purpose for all that is to praise and worship and give glory to God for all that He has done redeeming work of you and I through His Son. We'll see this again later in Romans. One of my favorite verses is Romans 11.36 For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things to Him be glory forever. Amen. All that God has done is for His glory. I was reminded of the five solas. The reformers had all these things that they laid out and kind of made as creedal things. But one of the ones I really like is called the five solas. Many of you ever heard that term before? Five solas. Let me see if I can remember them. The five solas are this. Scripture alone. Faith alone, Christ alone, grace alone, for the glory of God alone. Absolutely believe the five souls. The point of it all is the glory of God. People are saved for the glory of God because it is an affront to His holy nature that someone should live in rebellion against Him. God is glorified when you believe the gospel. God is glorified when you love His Son. God is glorified when you accept the diagnosis of your sin and your need for Christ. And God is glorified when you take Him into your life. 
God is glorified when your plans become His plans and your thoughts become His thoughts. We live and exist for the glory of God. So now we've come full circle in this outline. The good news, back in verse 1, comes from God. It is the gospel of God. It is preached by the preacher, promised by the Old Testament, personified in Jesus Christ, provided through grace and service, proclaimed by those who receive eternal privileges, and it's all for the purpose of glorifying God. I'm going to end today and end this outline with a poem by William Blaine. It goes like this. He who wept over the grave, he who stilled the raging wave, meek to suffer, strong to save, he shall be the glory. He whose sorrow pathway trod, he that every good bestowed, son of man and son of God, his shall be the glory. He who bled with scourging sore, thorns and scarlet meekly wore, he who every sorrow bore, his shall be the glory. Monarch of smitten cheeks, scorn of Jew and scorn of Greeks, priest and kingly divinely meek, his shall be the glory. On the rainbow circle throne and mid the myriads of his own, never more to weep alone, his shall be the glory. Man of slighted Nazareth, king who wore the thorny wreath, son of obedience unto death, his shall be the glory. His the grand eternal weight, his the priestly regal state, him the Father maketh great, his shall be the glory. He who died to set us free, who, who lives and loves even me, he who comes, who I shall see, Jesus only, only he, his shall be the glory. There's a song we sing quite often, and we all get a little bit louder when we sing that last verse. John Newton's famous hymn, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning thanking you, thanking you, thanking you for saving my soul, for saving our souls, And we look forward to an eternity of praising you for what you've done on our behalf. For praising you, for condescending and coming down and sending your son to do what we could not do for ourselves. We look forward to learning and growing and sharing in this lifetime that others may hear and know and come. But we look forward to seeing you, welcoming us home, that we may begin an eternity of thanking you and praising you for what you've done. I cannot see and heart cannot imagine and mind cannot conceive of the great things that you have bestowed for those you have loved through your son. We can't imagine, but we look forward to seeing it and thanking you for it every day for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I look forward to studying this book with you. It's going to be fun. It's going to be educational. Uh, we're going to have an invitation at this time. If there's some way that you need to respond to what's been preached and proclaimed this morning, we invite you to come. Number 343. Stand to see amazing.